Hi, everyone. Welcome to Extreme Hummingbird Extravaganza. In this portion of the event, our board president, Mike Williams, is going to give us an in-depth presentation about hummingbirds. Uh, this is a live video, so feel, feel free to ask questions in the comments, and we'll try to get them uh, in the end. So without further ado, welcome, Mike. Thank you, Celeste. So good morning, everybody. And what I'm going to talk about today is how truly amazing hummingbirds are. As you can see from the title, a life far from ordinary. So hummingbirds are a miracle of nature. Um, they are the second largest family of birds in the world after tyrant flycatchers and certainly a whole lot more colorful. Uh, at today's estimate, something around 330 species. I say something around because it's changing all the time and I've seen anything from 280 to 350 species. Um, they have the highest wing beats and heartbeat of any bird. And I will talk about that later. Um, but to give you an idea, their heartbeat can be up to 1,200 beats a minute and their wing beats up to 200 times a minute. They can truly fly in any direction. So despite rumors to the contrary, hummingbirds are the only bird that can truly fly in any direction. Um, there are lots of anecdotal stories about crows and ravens flying backwards. Um, they're urban myths, it's not true. Hummingbirds are truly the only bird that can fly in any direction, including backwards. Uh, someone asked me if they could fly upside down. Um, I'm not too many, sure too many hummingbirds have ever tried it, but uh, not as far as I know. And they are primarily a nectar feeder. So they're often seen with colorful plants. That's why human beings like to watch them so much. Uh, due to their own iridescence and the colorful plants they, uh, they feed from. Before anyone asks, they cannot live on nectar or sugar water alone. They have to eat tiny insects for protein. And occasionally you'll see a hummingbird snap at a small flying insect or a spider. So let's talk about a little bit about hummingbird classification. Um, uh, forgive me for all the Latin, but uh, I'll, I'll try and explain as I go along. So hummingbirds are grouped together with swifts and tree swifts in an order called apodiformes. Apodiformes in Latin means no feet. And if you ever watch a hummingbird swift or indeed a tree swift, if you've ever seen one, it looks like they have no feet at all. And um, in fact, they're very, very small and pretty useless. But, you know, two centuries ago, the Romans and, uh, and when they found them, the Latin classification, they had no feet. Um, that split into two suborders, a podi, which keeps swifts and, and tree swifts, and into hummingbirds, which is trochili. And hummingbirds are actually split in two. And there's a few pictures just to keep you interested. So swift on the left, a tree swift in the middle, and a fiery throated hummingbird on the right. Uh, hummingbirds are split into two. Um, Phaethornithinii, which is the hermits, of which there are 34 species, and Trochilinii, which is a typical hummingbird and has all the other species. Um, so to expand a little bit, here is a picture of a, a long-tailed hermit on the left and a rufous hummingbird on the right. Um, they are split almost or pretty much through their iridescence. You can see on the left, the hermit flashes his color, which is pretty uniform, whatever direction you're in. A trochilini on the right, typically you have to be at the right angle to see the iridescence. And as you can see on the, on the rufous hummingbird there on the right, its throat is flashing as us. I should call it a gorget, actually not a throat. So 
What are the true differences other than the iridescence? Well, hermits have a lack of pigmentation. They have pendant shaped nests and they have a different humeral tendon, which is the tendon that controls the wings. Um, typical hummingbirds, very strong pigmentation, typically nesting cups on branches. And again, they have a different humeral tendon to the, to the hermits. And mostly today, we're going to talk about the typical hummingbirds. OK, so as I say here, hummingbirds are new world wonders. They are only found in the new world. OK, there are no hummingbirds in the old world, no hummingbirds in Europe, Asia, the Middle East, Australasia. They are only found in North and South America. And here's a few examples. Um, what are their equivalents in the old world? Um, we've already seen the swifts, tree swifts. But in general, as nectar feeders, hummingbirds are replaced by what are called sunbirds. And this is a ruby-cheeked sunbird from, from Malaysia. So let's be very clear. If you leave the Americas, you are not seeing a hummingbird. As I said, 328 species or so in, in what's called a, a genera. There are 104 genera. Um, those are groups of hummingbirds that are very similar. If we look at the Americas, the greatest concentration of hummingbirds is in Colombia, um, Venezuela, Peru, um, where there are 100 to 150 species plus. Um, that gets less as you move away from the tropics, either north or south. In Canada, you can see there are less than 10 species. In Argentina, Chile, it gets down to between 10 and 40. The US has 31, I won't say commonly occurring species, but species that regularly occur in, in the US. And here's a few pictures. The one on the left is a calliope hummingbird. And as you'll see, is the smallest hummingbird that occurs in the US and indeed is jointly the smallest hummingbird in the world together with a bee hummingbird, which occurs in the West Indies. On the right is a broad-billed hummingbird. And the one at the bottom is a striped-tailed hummingbird from Costa Rica. So, as I said, 31 species. Um, interestingly, if you go east of San Antonio, typically you will only find ruby-throated hummingbirds. Okay, yes, there's the odd rufous, there's the odd broad uh, buff-bellied, broad-billed, but typically it's only ruby-throats. In the east, uh, uh, sorry, in the west, is where we find all the other species, except a couple that are US island and endemics of the West Indies. Size-wise, they run from anything from two and a half, two and three quarter inches, all the way up to five, five and a half inches. Um, interestingly, both the smallest, the calliope, and the largest, the blue-throated and the rivelies and the amethyst-throated, all occur to some degree in Texas. Um, as I said, west of San Antonio for all the other species, typically. Again, a few pictures. You've got a calliope, a rufous, and a costas hummingbird on the right there. So I said that hummingbirds only occur in the new world. Um, what's interesting is most of the fossils occur in the old world. OK, so the oldest new world fossil, i.e. the oldest fossil of a hummingbird found in, Ameri in the Americas is from Mexico and he's only 1.8 million years old. Uh, I should hesitate here. If any of you ever get to go to Mexico again, please don't buy hummingbird fossils. 
Um, there is a roaring trade in fake hummingbird fossils in Mexico, and believe me, they're all fake. However, the oldest hummingbird ancestor was found in Germany and is 47 million years old. There are also a few examples from France and Belgium um, that are 30 million years or so old. Um, how do we know they're hummingbirds? Well, there are a couple of reasons. One, the bone of the lower beak or maxilla has a hole in it which the tongue goes through. And we'll talk about the tongue of hummingbirds uh, a little bit later. The wing structure is very important. We're going to talk a lot about that, where the bird's wrist lies. And pro probably most conclusively, in the fossil hummingbirds, there is pot pollen present in the fossil stomach. Um, there are no other birds you would ever find that in. So we know that those are hummingbird fossils. Now, obviously, the continent split long before 47 million years ago. Um, it's likely that hummingbirds in the old world died out due to the temperatures and the lack of nectar bearing plants to sustain them. OK, so I'm going to talk a little bit about hummingbird physiology. Um, here's a hummingbird skeleton. We'll talk about the tongue and beak, as we said, the lower maxilla, the brain and the eyes, the muscle and the wings, and the heart and blood and the legs and feet. So first off, um, this fossil is very different from any other bird fossil. Um, I first draw your attention to the tongue and it's fossilized. So hummingbirds have a bone in their tongue, which we'll talk about. Um, next, I draw your attention to the muscle and wings and you can see the huge sternum bone um, by the rib cage there. And that's to support the huge muscles that it takes to fly. And the other thing that's very noticeable here is the size of the head and the brain and the eyes. And ask you to bear all of those in mind as we go through each one. So let's look at the lower maxilla or bill beak and its tongue. So hummingbirds, as we've said, feed, feed primarily on nectar. Um, a lot of people think they suck nectar up into their, into their beaks and down to their stomach. Um, that's not true. Um, what they actually do is flick their tongue in and out. Um, as it goes out, the nectar flows into little pockets in the tongue. And as it draws it back in, the nectar is pushed down its throat. It does that about 20 times a second. Um, this is a relatively recent discovery in the last five years. And for the uh, for those people who'd like to read more, the paper is called Hummingbird Tongs or Elastic Micro Pumps. Um, my advice is just to read the synopsis. Don't read the whole thing because you'll be very confused by the end of it. Um, the picture in the lower right, by the way, is an electron microscope picture of a hummingbird with its tongue out. And you can see the two filament-like extensions at the end. Those are what the nectar flows into before it draws it into the beak. Now, we said that hummingbirds have a bony tongue. The picture top left is actually a picture of the jaw and the tongue inside its beak. And you can see the bony structure. Um, let me see if I can put my mouse on it. Just here, you can see the bony structure of the tongue. Now, where does that tongue go to? It actually goes, as we said, through the bottom of the beak, which you can see here on the on bottom right. And it wraps all the way around its head and attaches behind its eye. And you can see the, the parts of the tongue in this skeleton here on the top. This is actually 
looking down on the skull and you can see the tongue wrapping round to go under the beak and out. Uh, is this unique in hummingbirds? The only other birds group that has a tongue like this are woodpeckers. And if you imagine woodpeckers are sticking their tongue under bark to try and pull insects out, you can see why they have a similar evolutionary development. Hummingbird tongues can be three times the length of the bill. Um, and I don't know any human beings who have quite that long a tongue. If we look at the heart and the blood now, a hummingbird heart is very, very similar to a human heart and very similar to most other birds. The difference being for its size, it's huge. It is the heaviest heart of any bird or animal at two and a half percent its body weight. Uh, that might not sound a lot, but your heart's probably uh, one fiftieth of your body. Uh, sorry, more than that, one five hundredth of your body weight. Heart beats two hundred and fifty beats a minute resting, and twelve hundred to twelve fifty beats a minute when flying. And for that reason, hummingbird blood has the highest red blood cell count of any animal or bird because it, it's running on overdrive. It has to transport oxygen, food at a very, very rapid rate. Now, what happens when it can't? Um, hummingbirds have the ability to slow their metabolism down and they go into what's called torpor. So if you ever have a, a frost in your garden and there are still hummingbirds around or were before it got cold, if you take a look under branches and leaves, you might find a hummingbird you think is dead hanging upside down. Um, he's not dead. He's just slowed his metabolism down and gone into a virtual state of hibernation or torpor. And they will be fine as long as it warms up fairly quickly for them to, to, to feed again. So muscles and wings. We talked a little bit about the huge sternum bone, um, which I'll come to in a minute. But first of all, let's take a look at the wings. Um, on the left here, you can see this is a hummingbird wing and this is a typical bird's wing. This is actually from a pelican. Um, if you look, you can see on a hummingbird, nearly all its arm or wing, if you like, is tucked into its body and it, it actually only flaps from its wrist and fingers. Most other birds use their full arm, full wing, Hummingbirds, only their fingers and wrist. And this is what we were talking about, the humeral tendon. That's what controls this joint. And it's different in hermit hummingbirds to traditional or typical hummingbirds. Uh, why is this so important? Well, this is why it can fly in any direction, because it has ultimate control over its fingers and, and uh, the feathers attached to them. So it truly can fly in any direction. Um, while I'm on the, on the subject, hummingbirds have the least feathers of, of any bird around, typically in the range of 900, which is a, a very small number compared to most birds. So here's the, here's the, uh, the wing, as I said, Average for a hummingbird, 15 to 60, but it can do 200 beats a second. Um, and as some of you know, and we'll talk about later, hummingbirds migrate. They can fly at 85 kilometers an hour, just over 60 miles an hour, which for a bird that's between three and five inches is truly uh, fast. Okay, moving on to that sternum we talked about and the chest muscles. Um, what you can see here, this is the sternum bone and this is the muscle that's attached. Um, no other bird has any sort of musculature 
that would drive the wing as hard as hummingbird for its size. Um, they're truly massive compared to any other bird. And as we talked about, the specialized humerus joint gives them a full 360 degree movement. Again, they can fly in any direction. And interestingly, um, in the Middle Ages, people actually thought when they moved to the Americas that hummingbirds were actually insects at the start. The reason being that their flight is more insect-like than bird-like. And if anybody's watched a, a bee or a wasp uh, closely, you'll see that the way they beat their wings and the way they maneuver them around, uh, hummingbirds are much more like insects than, than normal birds. Okay, so moving along to the brain and the eyes and the legs and the feet. Okay, its legs are very short. Remember I said a podoformes means no feet. They are very light and they're pretty much useless. They only perch on them and occasionally scratch with them. If you watch most birds take off, they launch into flight using their leg muscles and legs. Uh, hummingbirds can't do that. Their takeoff is purely driven through wing power and those large chest muscles. Really, they have no ability to, to leap or jump or launch themselves into flight. <sighs> Their brain is incredibly large for the size of the bird. It's about just over 4% of the total body weight. It is by far the largest brain in the avian world when compared to its total body mass. And its eyes are incredibly large, again, with relation to the size. It has binocular vision in front of it and monocular vision to the sides. Um, hummingbirds have a huge or high number of, con sorry, high concentration of rods and cones in their eyes. Um, the spectrum they see in is much wider than ours. They typically see in ultraviolet and uh, infrared, and their eyesight is truly excellent. Um, if you ever try and reach out and catch a hummingbird, I guarantee it will move out of the way. Um, that's because both its binocular and monocular vision are truly excellent um, due to this high concentration of rods and cones. All right, let's, let's move along and talk about hummingbird iridescence. One second. So everybody knows hummingbirds from their bright colors. And when you catch them, especially typical hummingbirds, when you catch them in their right light, their gorget flashes, their throat flashes. Um, this is some recent work done into feathers as to why this is so. So what was found is that there are three types of feathers in hummingbirds. There are feathers that have a holly, sorry, a holly, a hollow multi-layer. There are feathers that have a solid multi-layer construction, and there are feathers that are mixed. Okay, hollow multi-layer feathers will iridesce regardless of the light direction on them. So if you remember the hermit at the very start, it, it was green and it was iridescent green, but it didn't, it won't change with movement. A solid multi-layer type will not iridesce. It's like a normal bird feather. The mixed multi-layer type will iridesce or flash when you are at the right angle for that flash to occur. So we've all watched ruby-throated hummingbirds in our garden. We think, what's the big deal? Its throat's not really ruby red. And then suddenly you'll, you'll get the right incidence of light and it, and it is startlingly bright. That is because you are at the right angle to the mixed multi-layer type of feather. So what else can happen? Well. The picture on the right here shows 
what they call here the vanular angle, which is the angle you're seeing the light at. When you hit the vanular angle, it flashes. If you're not at the vanular angle, you, it won't iridesce unless it's a truly hollow type feather, which iridesces all the time. Now, the scientific list, list on the left, I picked two species out, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, there are, or has been, a lot of research into which hummingbirds have which sort of feathers. Um, hermits typically do not, or they iridesce, but they iridesce all the time because they don't have the mixed multi-layer of feathers. They only have the hollow type. Typical hummingbirds have all three types, but the mixed multi-layer is the gorget, is on its throat, and that's what flashes. Um, this has led to some reclassification of hummingbirds. It's going on, and it's one of the reasons I said at the start, anywhere between 290 and 360 species, depending on who you, re who you believe. Um, Right now, we sit at something like 328. That number will change. Um, for the anoraks amongst you who like the scientific papers, uh, the paper is called Hum Hummingbird Iridescence and Unsuspected Structural Diversity Influences Coloration at Multiple Scales. Um, again, please just read the synopsis. Don't read the whole paper. Um, I tried. And I realized I need a, a PhD in mathematics to understand it. Um, but the reference is there just in case you'd like to take a look. So as we looked at at the start, hermits on the left, hollow type feathers in the main, they iridesce continually. Typical hummingbirds on the right, it's their gorget, typically the iridesces, sometimes the cap and the back. Um, those are the mixed multi-layer feathers. The ones that don't iridesce at all are the solid type feathers. So if we look at this Rufus hummingbird here, you know, this is probably mixed multi-layer. Some of the feathers, the head and the crown and the back will iridesce all the time. Those are the hollow multi-layer and then you know, the plain chest, some of the wing feathers that don't iridesce at all, they are the solid multi-layer feathers. I, I make a big deal of this because hummingbird classification is going to change a whole lot more because of this discovery. This was 2016, I think it was. All right, just uh, coming towards the end, I'm going to talk a little bit about hummingbird migration and hummingbird distribution. So as we said at the start, the only commonly occurring hummingbird in the east of the US is the ruby-throated hummingbird, seen on the map here in red. Um, everything else is in the west, and you, you can see that here. Now, hummingbird migration, ruby throats fly across the Gulf of Mexico. It's the only hummingbird that really crosses water to any great extent. It takes it about 18 hours to get from the US to the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico or vice versa. Um, you know, for a bird that is about three and a half, four inches long, that's a, a, an amazing feat. All hummingbirds, all other hummingbirds, should I say, are, are landbound migrants and run down the west coast and around the landmass. So actually, ruby throats are the only ones that make this huge ocean crossing. Um, so my pictures on the right here, this is a rufous hummingbird. This is a wet, typically western hummingbird, would fly down the coast and is landlocked. The bottom one is a ruby throat, and that actually flies across the Gulf of Mexico. Um, do hummingbirds stay around for the winter in the Gulf Coast? There are a few that hang around. So there'll be a few ruby throats. Occasionally, there'll be uh, the odd rufous. Um, if anybody's been to the valley, 
Um, they'll know that the buff-bellied hummingbird occurs there. Um, buff-bellied hummingbirds are very strange. They migrate north for the winter. So our chances of seeing, not very far north, by the way, pretty localized, but our chances of seeing a buff-bellied hummingbird in our part of the world is typically uh, at its greatest in the winter. Those of you who go to Quintana now again might remember there was a buff-bellied hummingbird that hung around all last winter, um, basically because we were filling the feeder every day. So given that migration, um, let's talk a little bit just to finish on how hummingbird uh, sorry, how human activity affects hummingbirds. Um, number one, the range of hummingbirds is moving further to the north and south as the flora and the insect ranges change. That means it's further to migrate. Um, why, why are the flora and the insect ranges moving further north and south? Um, due to climate change. We can argue about whether it's man-made or, or naturally occurring, but there is no doubt that the world is generally becoming warmer and that is causing the flora and the insect range to change, which means hummingbirds have to change. The other problem with that is that it's pushing more species together. So they're having overlapping ranges all of a sudden. And that means a lot more comp competition for food and territory. Like all other birds, breeding and wintering ground habitat is disappearing. Um, some of you might know, and it says so at the bottom there, bird numbers are down by 70% plus since the 1970s. Uh, some species are down 90% plus. Um, the majority of this is due to habitat loss. Um, but certainly the stuff we've talked about with the climate already is, is having an effect. Not only are the ranges of the, the food supply changing, but flower blooming times and insect hatching times are changing. And that is causing a scarcity of food on their migration routes. So everybody needs to understand migration is a, is a carefully timed process to ensure that there's a food supply for the birds that are migrating along their route. If flower blooming and insect hatching times start to change, it might mean, or can and does mean, that sometimes on route on the migration route there is no food supply, and that means the bird dies. And we saw from the map earlier, most hummingbird species are, are uh, centered around the tropics. Unfortunately, the tropics, Central and South America, it is where the largest habitat loss is occurring. So we, we really are not helping hummingbirds and indeed birds in general at the moment. And that's why it's so important that we preserve habitats and that we all do our best. So, you know, we put feeders out and we plant flowers that are attractive to hummingbirds to see them. But honestly, it's a vital task to preserve the numbers of, of hummingbirds as they fly north and south. So just to finish, hummingbirds are truly amazing. Um, this picture, by the way, is my all time favorite hummingbird picture I've taken. This is a, a rufous hummingbird. In fact, a pair of rufous hummingbirds. Um, the one on the left was at a feeder the feeder was full and the one on the right decided it was time for, uh, for it to move. So pecked it on the back of the neck to make it leave the feeder to open up a slot. Um, as an aside, most of the photos you've seen today are for sale in the GCBO store. There is also a, a 2021 calendar, GCBO calendar that is all hummingbird pictures. Um, Please go to the online store and take a look. All the proceeds go to GCBO. And 
Finally, if you'd like to see like to see more pictures, this is my website here. I think I have about 7,000 bird pictures on there. And they're not all hummingbirds, obviously, but please feel free to take a look and, and make any comments you feel. And with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your, uh, for your participation. And if you have any questions, please fire away. Thank you, Mike. Um, we do have a few questions in the comments and as we're going through them, I'd encourage anybody to ask any remaining questions. Um, so the first question is, uh, should we warm up birds that are in the tarpor state, torpor? Torpor, no, yeah. no, just leave them alone. Um, they'll, they'll come out of it. You know, if you had a very prolonged cold spell um, some might die, but but their whole metabolism is designed to go into torpor for those for those uh, cold snaps. No, please just leave them alone. You know, actually, I've heard of a few people thinking they're dead and throw them in the dustbin or the mm -hmm. trash can. Please don't do that. Um, they'll be just fine. Okay, thank you. Um... And then uh, for the fossil, were the feathers preserved or was it just the bone? No, so so there are some some traces of feathers as a as an imprint in in the fossils. If anybody's seen um, the oldest fossil in the world, Archaeopteryx, which is a the, the ancestor of all birds, a dinosaur that had feathers, you can actually see the feathers in in the rock. Um, but actually, a preservation of the feathers is pretty unlikely. Feathers are made of keratin, which is the same as your fingernails, and eventually will uh, decay. All right. Uh, Joyce asks, why is there a bully hummingbird among the hummingbirds on our feeders? <laughs> uh, there is always a bully hummingbird. <laughs> <laughs> so if there's a competition for food, typically you'll find a, a dominant bird that guards the feeders with, uh, or your hummingbird feeders with a, a jealousy. Um, it will only give up once there are too many birds to scare off because while it's bullying all the others, it's not feeding. Right. So there is a critical number after which it will give in. Um, if anybody has a Rufus hummingbird, those are by far the most aggressive hummingbirds we see in this area. And they will typically bully the ruby throats um, forever and a day. Mm. They, they really are the biggest bullies you'll ever see, which is quite interesting because they're actually the smaller, are one of the smaller hummingbirds. Wow, Indeed, I was about last, to ask that. <laughs> well, last week I was in uh, the Davis Mountains and I was watching a Rivoli's hummingbird, which is five and a half inches. And it was bullied by a Rufus, which is three and a bit inches. Um, and I don't know whether the Rivoli is just a coward or the hummingbird, uh, the Rufus is, is super <laughs> aggressive. But it was very nopitous that the Rufus drove off the Rivoli hummingbird. <laughs> That's very funny. <laughs> and by the way, they will drive cardinals and other birds off as well. I believe it. They have attitudes. Yeah. Um, do hurricanes affect the ruby throat migration? Yes, they do. Um, you know, typically birds are very smart. They will delay their, their flight over the Gulf of Mexico if there's a storm in the area. Um, migration patterns change. They will, they will move, uh, change their flight path to avoid weather systems. In fact, um, I don't particularly worry about hummingbirds migrating across the ocean you know anybody who looks at migration roughly 25 to 30 percent birds don't survive migration particularly if their roots ocean going every year what's more concerning is the forest fires in the west right now some of you might have seen the reports of of all the millions of birds dying from uh, smoke inhalation and the forest fires in the West, that is clearly affecting hummingbird numbers and all other bird numbers right now. Hmm. So yeah, that is concerning. You know, we, we've seen a lot more uh, variation in the hummingbirds and other birds in, the, in West Texas this year 
and that is the birds that have had the chance to avoid the forest fires on the west coast and and you know western half of the u.s um mm. it's been great for bird watching in west texas but for bird numbers it's pretty terrible yeah um and then the last question from sherry uh is it okay to put the refrigerated food directly from the refrigerator or should it be at room temperature uh room temperature please okay in fact a uh, couple of things People have been uh, have been putting almost frozen hummingbird nectar out. Please don't do that because the water separates out from the sugar, and and you start to give them sugar overloads. Um, but more importantly, until recently, it was believed that you should change your sugar water every day. I hope most people are using a ratio of four to one. Um, recent evidence is shown that hummingbirds actually like the nectar that's been out a couple of days. So obviously, you know, changing it every day is fine if you want to, but you're not helping the hummingbird. Um, try to leave it two or three days. If you actually do an experiment with new and old nectar in, in different feeders, you'll notice the older, the older nectar is the most popular. Um, I'm still trying to find in the literature a reason for this, but I've seen that written down, you know, multiple times. Um, mm. You know, please don't leave your, your nectar too long because bacteria will grow and, and you'll end up poisoning the hummingbird. And please, please do not buy commercially available hummingbird nectar. Um, you have no idea what's in it. Um, the red dye is at best harmless, at worst, who knows what it's doing. Um, it's super expensive and, and the red, red and yellow coloration of your feeder will be enough to attract the, to attract the hummingbirds. Um, all that yellow, gu uh, sorry, red gunk that you see in Walmart and other places, please don't buy it. Just make your own. All right. Thank you, Mike. Um, that was all the questions that we had. Um, like Mike said, uh, there are calendars that he made for sale in the GCBO store. The link is in the description below. Um, and if anybody wants to tune in for Extreme Hummingbird Extravaganza this Saturday from 8 to 12, we'll be banding live hummingbirds and also doing more educational talks. So thank you very much, Mike. Thank you very much. All right. Bye. Bye. -bye.